Welcome to the seventh edition of C3, the conference for creative content, and day three of the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival. Uh, so again, thank you for being here. Um, what began as an idea to discuss new media and content in 2001 has shifted year to year to a series of panels that have relevant dialogue about the current ecosphere of Asian Pacific Americans and creative content. Um, you know, for, for us, we understand that filmmaking does not happen in a bubble and that our creative communities from directors, writers, producers, actors, editors, uh, and from organizations that support us and, and foster creative cross-connections that we need to push forward the conversation that affects us all. So um, again, thank you to our friends at SAG-AFTRA, sag Indy, Writers Guild of America West, uh, Directors Guild of America, uh, Motion Pictures Editors Guild, BuzzFeed, and the Korean Film Council. And we're also partnering up today with UCLA's uh, Luskin School of Public Affairs uh, just to commemorate today is the 25th anniversary of the LA riots. Um, thank you to our wonderful panelists and moderators, the ones who push forward towards the future. Um, and thank you to our staff and board, our, our volunteers. Also, shout out to Nancy and Maita at Leadership Education for Asian Pacifics for helping us put together uh, this conference. And really a big hand to our conference director, Milton Liu, for his leadership with this conference as well. Um, up next, I'd like to introduce um, um, one of our presenters uh, for this um, conference. Um, I'd like to say thank you to SAG PIACF, but also our presenting sponsor, Nielsen. So please welcome Clayton Young, Director of Community Engagements at Nielsen. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Um, uh, hello, I'm so thrilled to be here today to join all of you. What uh, Francis didn't mention that um, I'm also a proud board member of Visual Communications, so I wear two hats today as a board member and also as a representative of Nielsen, so I'm so happy to be here. Um, I think many of you know Nielsen as a television ratings company, right? Most of you have heard of Nielsen. Uh, we are, in fact, a global research company that not only measures uh, what everyday consumers watch, but we also measure what consumers buy and listen to. So we're a company that's invested in giving consumers a voice, including Asian Americans, by making sure that our preferences are measured. So why is that important, right? So for one thing, as Asian American consumers, we're spending a lot of money. We're spending right now annually $825 billion. $825 billion. That's a lot of money. So, for instance, we're spending money on technology. Uh, we are some of the most tech-savvy tech consumers in the U.S. 96% of us own smartphones. I have two. Uh, that's 7% higher than the total popul population. We are also important consumers in media. We're talking about media today. Um, there are currently 569 broadband-only Asian American households in the United States. And despite our small population, that's actually larger than Hispanic and black households. 85% um, of us are also reached by television weekly, and 80% of us are reached by video on our smartphones weekly. That's 11% higher than the total population. So that's a lot of consumption by our community. Um, we also watch just under 15 hours of live and time shifted, that's like DVR, TV weekly, that's a lot. And we also spend three hours weekly watching multimedia device on our multi -div -div multimedia devices. So what about some of the shows right now? We know that shows with Asian American leads, casts, and storylines are among the top watch shows. Shows like Dr. Ken, Fresh Off the Boat, Quantico, Marvel Agents of Shields are making huge impact in the market. In fact, Fresh Off the Boat ranked 17 last week among viewers of 18 to 49. So that's why Nielsen is committed to telling the Asian American consumer story to make sure that businesses and advertisers know about us and what we're watching and buying. We have a report, so feel free to go on nielsen.com if you want to learn more about Asian American consumers. Uh, and in the future, if you're ever asked to participate in the Nielsen uh, study, please say yes. So now, um, please help me welcome the man behind C3, uh, Visual Communications Director of Programming and Artist Services, Milton Liu. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're tremendously honored to have such a gathering of 
prestigious people today and throughout C3. Uh, this year's theme is actually Future Forward. As you may know, the goal of C3 is to have a dialogue regarding the future of the ever-changing landscape of media. Whether it's film, television, cable, digital, animation, gaming, transmedia, it's our goal to communicate, collaborate, and celebrate with each other. I do want to mention that we'll be continuing C3 tomorrow, here again at Janum, and then on Monday we'll have a panel at the Korean Cultural Center in Mid Wilshire. And lastly, at the end of all of our C3s, we'll actually have a reception um, at the conclusion of the day. And today's reception is actually going to be in the lobby of Janum and Alexlo in the garden. So we hope you can join us for that. Uh, just some quick house rules. Please no recording of this panel. You can take non-flash photos, and we encourage you to share it on your social media. Um, at the conclusion of each panel, we'll also have a 15-minute break. Uh, please take all conversations out into the lobby so that we can set up for the next panel. Um, and everyone got a little sticker today. I don't have mine. Um, but the museum is actually open today, so uh, if you have that sticker, feel free to go sh uh, take a look at all the exhibits that they have here at Janum. All that out of the way, um, I'm really happy and really honored to present our first panel directed by, or presented by the Directors Guild of America. It's called Directing, in Horror, or Directing Horror in Genre, and it'll be moderated by co-chair of the DGA Asian American Committee, Stephen J. Kung. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're just going to get right into it, because uh, I heard that we already made introductions. Uh, let's first open by talking a little bit about the f this festival. We have some filmmakers here with special relationships to this festival. I think, uh, Viet, you found your true love here? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, um, I found my true love, my uh, writing partner here. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I, actually, yeah, I've been coming to this festival for about 10 or 11 years. Uh, I did meet my writing partner here at this festival 10 years ago, but I also, this is my 10-year anniversary of meeting my wife, who's running around with my kid back there. And uh, yeah, we met at this film festival uh, after, at an after party. Um, my wife likes to glamorize it by saying we met at a bar, but it was an after party. And uh, yeah, we hit it off, and now we have a kid and stuff, so uh, you guys... Keep coming out here. Maybe you'll find your true love. <laughs> Jennifer. Yes. Uh, I cannot remember exactly the first time I came to this festival, but it was the first festival that played my, one of my early short films, um, coming out of AFI, and played four or five of my other films. And we, um, we played my second feature, Advantageous, as well, um, two years ago. And, uh, we were in competition in one stuff, and I'm really grateful. Um, and I've just always felt like this was the most important validating festival for Asian Americans and Americans that I've encountered. And uh, we're going to kick off the first question with Michael Goy. Um, let's talk about why we're here. What? I thought that was the first question. All right. Oh, the, se <laughs> the, the first question about horror. Um, why are we here? Why horror? Why direct horror? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's always fun to find new and interesting ways to kill people. And, and um, <laughs> yes. you know, the Japanese and Koreans, especially in, in the last 15, 20 years, have, uh, have uh, kind of redefined, I think, the genre in many ways. And, and American uh, production companies and distributors have, have taken up that, you know, and remade movies that, that we had already made. So, so it's, it's, you know, horror has always been a genre, I mean, since the beginning of the, of the motion picture industry that has been um, profitable, where you were able to, to make a movie for very little money and get it distributed and get it seen because it wasn't reliant so much on big name stars and really expensive effects, you know. So it's, it's, it's just a reliable genre, and I think a lot of young people kind of gravitate toward the horror genre because of that. You know, they can express their, their vision in, in that format. The, the barrier to entry is lower. 
And in that way, it might attract people from disadvantaged backgrounds looking for a way in. Yeah, or anybody who has a unique vision because horror by its very nature kind of lends itself to very extreme imagery. And uh, it, you know, it's, it's generally, generally not a complacent uh, genre visually. So, so people who have those kinds of visions, who have intensely creative uh, ways of seeing the world, I think are naturally drawn to, to the, the way they, they can express themselves in horror. Yeah. Well, I, I know someone with, uh, also with a, a very original vi vision is Jennifer. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about you know, why you chose the sci-fi genre. Sure. Uh, well, coming into... Well, my first feature was Half-Life. It was a 2008 Sundance, and um, that was a family drama with, with some sci-fi in it and some fantasy in it. And, and I think that I'm just a bit of a dreamer. I like escaping this terrible world, and I like to think of beautiful places to be and, and the ways we can alter our current reality. So that was like this, you know, baby Jennifer. That was what I was doing early on. Um, but then I kind of evolved in, you know, kind of appreciation. And yeah, some of my early... Um, influences did include like vampire art films and um, The Shining. Um, so I'm, I'm super driven or I became intoxicated by elevated genre, elevated right. horror um, and elevated sci-fi like Blade Runner, for example. I um, mean, you could say that Battlestar Galactica is one of my, my that's my biggest oh, influence. I love that show. And super, I think it's elevated because I think it takes on things that I want to take on, race, gender, politics, class, you know, terrorism, everything, um, and it kind of makes us look at ourselves as humans first. So that was a big influence when I was asked to make a proposal for ITVS. Um, they had a, a Future States, a series called Future States, which was basically three seasons, four seasons of, of, sh of short films, like an in an anthology format, and they asked me to propose something, so that's when I proposed Advantageous, which was a... Uh, mother-daughter story um, that take, took place in about 2046. It was about a single mom who um, was considering putting herself into a new body, a younger body, um, to keep her job. And it brought up a lot of issues uh, about women and our value in society and the future of women. And I think it, it caught fire because it was relevant. And it, it just happened to kind of coincide with people starting to understand, you know, that 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 we had something in front of us. Uh, the future of women is in jeopardy. Um, it's always been in jeopardy, but, uh, but now more than ever, uh, <laughs> we can say it is. Uh, so, so all I'm saying, I guess, in the end, is that sci-fi and horror are really helpful, accessible ways to explore issues of, of deep concern for me. Absolutely. We're going to get into that a little further down in the discussion. Sure uh, Viet. Um, by the way, I'd, I'd like to give my wife's um, review of... Uh, Jennifer's movie, she described it as thought-provoking and fucked up. So uh, you guys should go see it. Um, anyway. It's on Netflix. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, I don't take pride. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a very smart person. I just like to be scared. So uh, that's, I, I, I love horror movies in that sense, uh, the roller coaster of it all. And so uh, the I don't, I don't have any other... I'm He's really... pretty smart. <laughs> yeah. well, well, what makes something scary for you? Um, you say you like to be scared. Like how do you, as a director, how do you make something scary? How do I make something scary? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think for me, I, 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 I like, the, I like the, the setup of it not potentially being scary and then it's scary. Or, I, I, don't, I don't know. Why are you making me talk? This is, why am I here? Uh, <laughs> I, I I think there's a lot of things that make. I mean, setup is all. It's all about setup. It's all about character, and I think, uh, and that means a story-wise setup, uh, but also even the setup of uh, of like building a really scary scene. I mean, uh, you know, a build-up of two minutes before a scare. That that kind of a setup could you know, really play into it. Uh, I, th I think I know what yeah, you're talking about. Yeah. Like in the sixth sense, like you know something bad's gonna happen when yeah. there's, uh, when the temperature drops, 
or in, a ch or in like the James Wan directed uh, Final Destination, when the John Denver song plays, you automatically have this sense of dread coming. Yeah, it's, I think it's dread. Dread's the right word. Foreshadowing setups. But also, yeah. the, you know, you have to be invested in your characters first to care about them and to believe they're real. And, and so kind of searching for what's real, what, selling the status quo first, uh, so that anything that jeopardizes the status quo is, is a problem. Is, is raises the drama, raises the tension, stakes. Right. Yeah. Michael? Yeah, well, I mean, what Jennifer says is absolutely correct. I mean, people don't really care about a person standing next to a buzzsaw who may get his arm sawn off, but if, if you've spent time with that character and you've got to know them and you feel that they're a real person or somebody that you have an intimate knowledge of, and then that person is standing next to a buzzsaw about to get their arm sawed off, then, then it means something, then there's tension. And I think that's something that, that the producer Val Luton in the 1940s really understood when he made those nine movies for RKO, like The Cat People, Curse of the Cat People, The Ghost Ship, you know, is, is that you, know, you had to be emotionally invested in the characters or the, the frightening situation is not going to mean anything. That's true. But what about investing in the, uh, the villain? I, I find that in horror movies, a lot of time, it's best not to show the villain. Um, you know, and then almost when you see the villain, it sort of ruins it. Like, you know, in uh, M. Night Shyamalan, Shyamalama Ding Dong movies, when uh, you see uh, the one signs, you finally see the villain, you're like, oh, but like an alien, you know, if you see only glimpses of the alien, you get, your yeah. mind psychs yourself out. I, I would say that's probably in my, my feature crush of school is probably, that's my biggest regret is not spending a little bit more time time uh, developing the bad guy. Uh, I, I always describe the bad guy as, as Jaws. I mean, there was like this looming kind of shark floating around and you never see him. And then I feel like in my movie, once you see him, you're just like, uh, well, he's, I mean, scary white guy. Uh, so, I mean, which is scary in some places. Like here, it'd probably yeah. be scary, right? Yeah. No, but no, uh, but, um, but yes, so I, I agree. I, I, you know, there there are movies out that, out right now where the villain there when you take that time to kind of develop that villain, it's it's just uh, it's juicier. Yes, um, to quote the late Jonathan Demme, uh, when he was making uh, Silence of the Lambs, he says that your movie is only as smart as your villain. And what part of the appeal of horror for me is that um, is is part of what Michael was talking about is you have enormous stakes, and part of what makes those stakes enormous is that the villain is so much more powerful than the protagonist. They're supernatural or pre preternaturally powerful, and so you're rooting for the underdog to the extreme. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the craft and the grittiness of what makes things scary. When you guys are on set and you're actually directing the horror scene, like, what do you say? Do you say to the zombie, like, act like you want to eat more flesh, or like, crawl across the ceiling on your, like, like, what kind of directing, like, how do you direct those horror scenes? How do you make them scary? Um, let's start with uh, Jennifer, just to mix things up. Okay. Um, so I directed an episode of The Exorcist in the fall, and we Which had, gave me nightmares, by the way. And gave you nightmares, thank, thank God. But uh, I, you know, I, I've really hadn't invested much time in working with gore and, and before, but I knew what I liked. And we had this huge tunnel scene where you had about, you know, 40 possessed people in a dark tunnel. Um, and, you know, technically I, technically, I don't think we're supposed to really direct the extras as much as they were, but there were some featured people. But I, but I always tried to speak as personally as possible so that you kind of look at, you know, the origin story of this particular zombie, zombie and what might be hurting their feelings or, you know, why they have angst, why they have anger. Um, I, I didn't get that specific with everyone, but I did with a few. How about um, during the um, demon possession scene in The Exorcist where they, they willingly have this seance and the po chief of police develops a third eye? Like, what do you tell him? Like, you're about to, you know? Well, it's, it's a little bit scripted, so, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not the author of this episode. I'm just director coming in, but it, it is, we talked a lot about a sense of power. Um, these, it, so in the, in this, I'm going to ruin this for some thousand people, but in the, uh, in the scene, some high, like the, yeah, the chief of police 
is, is basically in, in league with the Illuminati and he wants to get possessed by the demon, um, among other, and a, a bunch of rich people want to be possessed in, in, in league with Satan. Um, and they have a seance and they, they summon the devil and then he possesses one of them. Um, and, I, and we talked about, you know, just why they wanted, why they wanted that power and what it felt like, what it must feel like to, to feel um, finally fulfilled. So it's grounded in human emotion, ultimately. Yeah, human desire, human weakness. Mm. Yeah. Michael. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a director as well as a, a cinematographer, so, you know, approaching horror or a horrific sequence, uh, you know, really kind of roots down into several different things for me, but the, the, the most important thing, I think, is the psychology of the, uh, the characters and, and the moment. Um, there was a, a, a sequence in season two of American Horror Story where uh, one of the lead characters wakes up and she's in the lair of the, uh, the mass murderer bloody face and she's prisoner there and, and there's all these gleaming uh, tools and, and like plastic splattered with blood and, and floor drains and, and stuff. And, and I, I started thinking, well, you know, it's, it sort of reminds everybody of their worst fear when they go to the dentist. And so I, I lit it instead of dark and moody and shadowy and stuff, which I think would have been completely predictable and uh, not as effective. I, I lit it with fluorescent light tubes, very bright. That's and, brilliant. And the, the actress came into the set and said, is it going to be this bright? And I said, yes. She said, well, how is this going to be scary? I said, it's like you're going to the dentist's office. And she got it immediately. <laughs> you know? so, but that was a, a visual and a feeling that everybody in the audience could immediately pl plug into and plug into their own fears of. Whereas if I had lit it like a conventional horror or scene, it, it just would not have been as effective. Right. So. I like that. Of course, you can do so much with lighting. You also do some other tricks on American Horror Story too. You guys shoot on. You, you, I think you were telling me you guys shoot on film, and then you degrade Lighted, the film. Lighted, yeah. Like for the first five years of, of the uh, the show, yeah, we sh we shot everything on on film, and, and you know, like if I wanted a flashback, I, sh I shot it on Super 8 because it looks like everybody's memory of something from their past. If I had something that was supposed to look as as Ryan Murphy put it, like 1930s Nazi Germany fetish porn movies. <laughs> you know, we, we did it all in camera. We took 16 millimeter film, we unspooled it on the floor in the dark room, we tossed it around like a salad, we sprayed water on it, we hit it with a hair dryer, flashed it once Amazing. with a flashlight, and then stuck it in a hand crank camera and shot it. And it looked just like 1930s fetish porn <laughs> Nazi movies. So. Uh, but then why, after achieving such great looks with that, why would you guys move to digital? Is it money or? Well, uh, uh, somebody else is, is shooting the, uh, the show now. They, oh, so and, that and, DP is. And, and they, they fr frankly had an aesthetic for season six that lent itself more to, to digital capture. So it, uh. so it was part of, of that aesthetic. But you know, it, it's, it's just a different different thing. You know, Ryan considered me to be a director. You know, okay. and he was kind of moving on and employing more women, which is a great thing. You know, in directing American Horror Story. Be it. Well, what was the question? The, the original question was to talk about directing the horror scene. How do you give adjustments to the actor? Ways to make it scary? How do yeah, you make I, it scary? I, I think I, just more along the lines of what these guys are saying. Um, I, I think if, as long as you are. The, the core of it all is, is it real? Does it feel like the actors are real? And um, of course, story helps that, you know, the setup and all that stuff. So, uh, and, and I think the more real, I mean, you know, the stuff that I do is, I do a lot of horror but with comedy. Uh, and, you know, the things that I was juggling was, uh, I wanted to legitimately be scary, but legitimately also be funny. Uh, and the only way to do that is the actors have to play it real. They, right. you know, no, if, sure. if they're mugging like it's a sitcom, it's it's just not. You're not going to feel the fear. And you know, if you're, if if you don't believe that they're really scared, then you know, none of, none of this plays. So uh, you know, I, I think, you know, just basically what they said, keep it real. Keep it real. I'd love to go into a little bit about each of your films at this point, um, specifically with regard to race. I mean, we're all Asian American, and we've all made um, films, or, or you know, or are about to cast films with Asian Americans in them. Let's go down the line. Viet, in 
in Crush the Skull, you have an Asian American cast. And one of my favorite lines is when the lead female is in danger and she tries to call the police, she calls the police, and to get the police to come sooner, she tr plays the white privilege card. She's like, I'm white, it's basically saying, come sooner. Like, I was wondering if you could tell me, like, why, you know, Crush the Skull could have been made of any ethnicity. Why Asian American? Um, I, and how do you think that intersection enhanced the film? Well, honestly, I, I, I didn't make the movie for it to be, you know, I, I think if you watch the movie, it could have been any, any race. Uh, and I think that was part of the fun of it all was that I didn't make a movie with Asian Americans with an Asian American theme to it all. Um, although when I had the Asian Americans in there, I, I took plenty of, you know, there was, there was plenty of jokes to be had in the, situ in the situations and everything. So, uh, but I, you know, I kind of feel like that's in general what, what we're all trying to do is we're all just trying to normalize what's normal anyway, which is there are stories out there with Asian Americans and they are normal American stories like anybody else. It's, you know, it's what Denzel is doing uh, in the black community. Every, not all of his movies are black themed. And, um, and I, can, I kind of feel like my movie was kind of that same situation, so. Uh, but yes, I, I did throw in some racist jokes in there just for fun. Racism is funny, yay. <laughs> um, Jennifer, in Advantageous, you have an Asian American cast that's also female. And um, it's such a wonderful film because it's, it's, um, it might, reminds me of Margaret Atwood. It makes me think of George Orwell. It's wonderfully dystopian. And one of the plot points that I found really interesting is, I mean, like, Jacqueline Kim needs to retain her job by getting into a younger body, which is more universal, universally appealing. And Jacqueline Kim, you know, looks like Jacqueline Kim. She's got, you know, she's got very traditional Korean features. And then the body she transfers into, I think is kind of ethnically ambiguous. That's not a coincidence, is it? Not a coincidence. Um, um, yeah, it, it was supposed, you know, in discussion I, I, with my producer when I was scripting the short, the he, he thought, you know, maybe she should be like a blonde, white woman, um, but I kind of thought that was a little easy um, for, you know, maybe too easy <laughs> for the future, you know, every Asian person <laughs> wants to be a white person or every Asian person needs to be a white person to gain value or, or have market appeal. I mean, unfortunately, that's a little bit too close to true right now. Um, but I thought that, yeah, the future of, of, of appeal and, and, or the present of this, you know, what seems marketable are, are people who, who as many people as possible could, could, could connect with. That would be the, so, so yeah, we, we worked with Freya Adams and Freya actually has, uh, she's part Indian, um, Part, I believe, middle. I, I cannot remember which which country she, her other side of her family is from. I think it's Persian, yeah. And um, but she, but to many people, she comes off as actually. What's fabulous about her casting is that depending on who you are, you think she's some someone else. Right. Some people you will say she's tell. Latino. Some people will say she's yeah. white. Some people will. And I, I was just pleased by that after in after the in the aftermath and talking with all of her audiences. Um, but yeah, I I didn't want to like go straight for the jugular, but I did want to bring it up a little bit. Um, right. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit as well about, you know, casting. Well, J Jacqueline helped write it, right? Jacqueline but also, like, the idea of making it with an Asian, um, Asian female cast. With an Asian female cast. Right. So Jacqueline came on after I made the short for ITVS. Uh, I had, you know, Jacqueline brought so much energy and love into the film, I, I've said, let's take that. Let's take it and make it bigger. Um, so we we hunkered down in my parents' house and when they were away and spent a week like just boarding the entire script. Um, so your your question about Asian American women and what what what, are, what is the nature of the question? Just so I I, oh, I, I just wondered what it meant to you to make oh. that movie with an Asian American lead. With an Asian, oh, I always make <laughs> movies with Asian American female leads. That's my thing. Um, I uh, love it because I don't know. I, I feel like it's it's necessary. We are and like we, who else is going to do it? So uh, right. somebody, some of us have to do it. I mean, it's <laughs> it's. Uh, I mean, it's a great year for Asian American females. You know, at least three of them. Um, and 
Scarlett. Are there three of you? And Scarlett, yeah. Oh, and Scarlett. And Scarlett. Um, so, thanks, Scarlett. So, uh, it's a, it, I'm just going to go into the old stereotype of, you know, Asian American women or Asian women. We, we're kind of split between cultures sometimes. Um, we've been socialized to be, to be invisible when necessary and visible when necessary, but kind of curated by a probably patriarchal world that's international and also, you know, the America itself has its, its, its kind of Caucasian-driven um, agenda. And so, you know, I've, I've experienced that. I've lived through it. I've thought about it. I've reflected on it for years. And, and so, you know, I have a little bit, I have a little, you know, a little bit of residual, oh, you know, I have a lot to say that I haven't said yet, you know? Yeah. And, and I think um, I'm hoping that that continues, not, obviously not just with my voice, but with many voices of Asian American females and, and other females who haven't been represented. It, it goes back to what you were saying at the beginning, how part of the appeal of the genre is that you get to uh, weave together this beautiful allegory and tell the stories you want to tell from a specific point of view. And, you know, it, sure like, I, love it. I love that film because everything in that is a commentary on our society and holds the mirror up. The character that Jacqueline plays, Gwen, you know, she is the voice of a company that is run by happens to be run by white people who are all about money, the bottom line, and she's happy to play that role. Right. She's happy to buy in because that's because because she needs to protect her daughter and make sure her daughter. So, right. so it's all fear driven, um, which I think was a dynamic I absorbed quickly when I lived in New York and how. It's real. You know, so many of us yeah. have sold out. Yeah. It's <laughs> and I mean, it, it's hard to to fight against that unless we do it together. Right. Let's talk about American Horror Story, Roanoke. Um, I, I love this show, especially how it gets crazy meta towards the end. But towards the beginning, in your episode, you have this interracial couple um, that's harassed by hillbillies, and then at the same time also harassed by the supernatural. And at times, they're conflating the two. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, I mean, uh, you know, all, all, all races and genders are open when you want to torture somebody. So, <laughs> I mean, it's a, you know, I, I think it's it's great that they featured an interracial couple in this last season and as the, the centerpiece of, of the show. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, we as as Asian filmmakers. I mean, I, I know that Albert Kim, when I directed an episode of, uh, of. Uh, Sleepy Hollow, was it? Sleepy Hollow, yeah, he, he posted, he says, so we have an Asian American showrunner, an Asian American lead actress, we have a, an Asian American writer who wrote this episode, an Asian American director, which was me. And, right. and it, was, it wasn't like it was planned, it, it was like there were, all of us were in the industry kind of floating around and it just kind of came together in one episode. But, but you know, the... Um, Do you feel like there's a special sensitivity towards Asian Americans when that happens, when you have that synthesis? I don't, I don't know, maybe on the part of, of some Asian American filmmakers, you know, who are looking to, to get into the industry still and, and try to make their way, but, you know, certainly those of us, I think, in, in the industry are, are looking, actively looking for ways to, to get more Asians on the screen and, and behind, behind the scenes. And it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a process, and it's, it's all driven by, certainly, by money. Um, you know, it's, I, I wrote a, a script uh, recently, a pilot for a, a show, show uh, which featured an Asian female bisexual magician uh, in Las Vegas. And we didn't really shop it, but we talked about it with a couple of uh, networks. And you know, and there was one junior executive who said, yeah, but Lucy Liu is all tied up on elementary. And I was thinking, okay, well, I didn't think Lucy was the only person who could do this. But, <laughs> but and it, it wasn't spoken out of uh, malice or it wasn't spoken out of just, you know, um, a denial of, of the value of Asian people. It was spoken purely out of the standpoint of marketing and what they're comfortable and plugged into in terms of marketing product and what they think will, will sell, so, or what the personalities think, that will sell. What do you think we can say when people bring that up? What can we say to counter that? Well, I, I think we, we counter it by the, the movies that we make and, and the people that we employ. And, you know, I mean, I, I've been loving the Bear Paint Company, I think it's B-E-H-R, 
because I see their commercials and, and they have like a mixed Asian and, and Caucasian family for, for no reason. It's not like only Asians can buy their paint, but it makes me want to buy their paint. <laughs> I mean, I felt the same way when I saw their commercials as, as when I felt in the 1970s and I saw an Excedrin commercial and there was an Asian man who was talking about the benefits of Excedrin. And, and it was, he wasn't there because he was Asian or it, it making a point about, you know, Asian people buying pain reliever, he just happened to be Asian. And to see more of that, I think, infiltrate the consciousness yes. of this country and the world, I think would be a great thing. And that's, you know, that's what we have to do, you know, as, as filmmakers, that's our responsibility as we go forward. That was the normalization you were talking about. Um, Michael, and, and I know you're casting for your feature film, Mary, right now, and you mentioned to me that two of your leads are going to be Asian American men. I was wondering if you could talk about that casting choice. Well, you know, in casting, you you kind of debate different things. Like when I, I wrote and directed a, a very small feature film called Megan is Missing, which is about abducted and murdered children and internet predators. And I was on, I think I was on the board of CAPE at the, the moment, or I certainly was a member of CAPE. And somebody from CAPE asked me, you know, are you going to be colorblind in your casting for the two uh, female leads? And I said, no, the girls... They're 14 year old girls. I said, they're gonna be cute and white. And she said, why would you do that when you're in a position to change that? And I said, because that's what America is used to seeing every single night when they turn on the TV and there's a report of an abducted child is, is she's cute and white. I said, that's in complete denial of the fact that 50% of abducted children are actually boys and most of them are black or Hispanic and they get ah. no airtime, but the cute and white girls do. So I said, I need to, to make them cute and white to, to have the audience plug into everything that they see every night and then take them where these things go and make my points about the fact that there was a 10-year-old kid from, from Crenshaw who's also missing at the same time, but he gets 15 seconds on the air and the cute right. white girls get a half-hour show. So, you know, in casting uh, movies and stuff, I'm, I'm casting right now a, a movie called Mary, which is a, a thriller that takes place on a sailboat and that has evil intentions. And, you know, it's, it's like the sailboat is the monster. The, uh, you know, like in Fall of the House of Usher, the, the, the house is the monster. Right. Um, you know, we are certainly looking uh, around to, to get a diverse cast. Um, you know, and this is interesting for me because I haven't cast a movie, uh, the budget is 10 million, which is still fairly tight, but it's you know more than I've worked with on features before. And to go through that process of the agencies, of, of packaging people, of, of them saying, well, if we go to CAA or UTA or whatever, you know, these are the people that are available. And then trying to find in that list, you know, something that gives me some feeling of diversification. You know, that's, that's kind of the struggle I think we all deal with as we enter into th these things is, is, you know, you have to start working within the system in order to change the system. Right. So what he's saying is that the studio is a, they, they're, the one thing that they're, they're allowing you to do though is they're going to allow you to use an Asian boat, right? <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and, then, and then we'll use all white people otherwise. I, I'll, I also want to add to what you said. Uh, there is, um, you know, I, I just worked on a show, Dear White People, which started streaming on Netflix yesterday. I hope <laughs> all of you are watching it. Oh, thank you, Roxy. Um, that's my mom over there. Uh, but basically, hey, there is, uh, like, one of the things we taught, so the, the show is an allegory for the civil rights movement that happened, and sort of, like, a, we're examining a microcosm of that that happens at a fictitious uh, Ivy League University among the black pe population. And we actually have two different approaches. You know, there's, there's the MLK or the Malcolm approach. You know, it's Huey Newton or Whitney Young. And I definitely think there, you know, what you're talking about, Michael, is how there's a space for working from inside the system. And that's absolutely one way to do it. And also, I want to reify that another way to do it is also to like be outside the system as well and push what people see as normal um, and sort of stretch their boundaries a bit. I feel like there's room for both of that. And when people study the civil rights movement, that's actually what happened. We had people, we had warring factions within the civil rights movement, but all of those um, helped create the change. Uh, let's keep talking about um, 
about horror. Like one thing you had talked about earlier and I want to get into is, you know, as Asian Americans, we have a very different perspective on film than Asians do as sort of evidenced by uh, like all the whitewashing, whitewashing movies that have come out as of late, like uh, the Scarlett Johansson, Ghost in the Shell, you know, my friends in Taiwan saw it, and they're like, it's great, Scarlett's great, and people here are like, uh, you know, so, um, and you were talking this, about this in the green room, maybe you could elaborate on the, um, what are the differences between AAPI horror and Asian, Asian horror, or K horror, or J horror? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll kick that off. I mean, uh, I think the, the difference initially uh, between J horror and K horror and, and uh, other forms of horror is that a lot of it was rooted in the mythology of, of the, uh, and the consciousness of, of the, the different countries that it came from. I mean, when you look at the, the ghost movies from in the 1950s in Japan, like Kwaidan and, and Onibaba and the stuff, I mean, th those were movies that, that were really based on, on traditional Japanese, you know, uh, thoughts and themes. And, and you know, it's, it's exciting to see just the, those traditions uh, reflected in a genre that gets international attention. You know, it subsequently gets picked up by other countries and redone in other countries that don't have the same sensibility or the same spiritual connection to what those stories came from. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, is, is that it's, it's a great form of expression about, you know, your, your country and, and the traditions and the value of, of your country, I think, you know, that, that got expressed. In That's good. Way. I hadn't thought of that. Jennifer. Uh, same question for you, the differences you see between uh, Asian horror and Asian American horror. Uh, or uh, then maybe if you could talk a little bit about like your favorite movies of that genre, the Asian genre as opposed to... Asian genres. Uh, well, I wanted to, before I go there, a quick jump back to, to the, when, you, when, when Michael mentioned the, the the, um, the visibility of kidnap of people who are kidnapped, young young yes. people are kidnapped. It's interesting because you know we're talking about social issues coming through horror. Um, the episode of Exorcist that I did also had the same theme. It was yes, it was right. the, the idea that a young white girl had gone missing, but like ten eight to ten black Americans in the neighborhood next door who all were murdered. No one there was no news coverage at all. So I think that at least on the optimist, you know, I, I feel optimistic when I see that that the industry, you know, writers inside the industry who happen to be also white, are, are doing everything they can to kind of use use the attraction of the genre for for uh, for positive change. Yeah, I, I, hopefully. Yeah. So for those of you who haven't seen her episode, there's a Black Lives Matter protest, and they yeah. sort of take the moment away from the protagonists who are standing on City Hall, and they start reading the names of the people who were abducted. Right. And what I think you do a beautiful job of, like, and we actually stay with them. Like, even though we're not on her face, you hear the dialogue as we cut to different scenes inside the morgue, and those names resonate with you. It's, it's, it's intense. You're actually looking at the blood and guts of the, of the black Americans who'd been killed, and it's so scary to, like, to go, okay. When I was like, okay, we're about to make this really intense scene happen where you're looking at the body parts that are about to be turned into a sacrifice um, for the devil, but you're also reading the names of real people, you know, and you have to kind of deal with the fact that these are real bodies, um, you know, that we should care about more, you know, just as much as any other body. It's a, the idea of bodies mattering, <laughs> I, know, I know this is such a, it is a thing. It's like, okay, we need to understand their bodies here. We have bodies in, in hmm. yeah. Out of my um, curiosity, are, are there black people in the writer's room? There's a black person in the writer's room. There That's was, better than zero. Yes. I, I, I don't want to get too much into getting into trouble here, but sure. I will say that I, I <laughs> damn it, that, that <laughs> we had great discussions and, 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 and awareness happened all around. And, and I think we made some strong adjustments in, um, in representing the, the protest. Um, Great. So, all is good. So, um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I actually super respect that that it happened that way. Um, I'm glad you got into it, and feel free to like jump in on or piggyback on it anyone. Don't wait for me to yeah. like jump in. But yeah, that's 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 great. My favorite Asian horror, um, you know, I think like 
the ring started it yeah. all for me. Um, everything that Roy Lee brought over was interesting. Um, and uh, I think the difference, there's just a colder feeling. Like there's a, there's a colder feeling to all the, everything that I've experienced in Japan and, and Korea that liberated me. Because um, you're treating horror as if it's art, horror as an art film. I mean, I'm not a super huge, like, I cannot remember the name of it, but, you know, tearing bodies apart in front of you kind of horror fan. I'm more of the, like, psychological, like, I, I right. love those kinds. As far as Asian American horror, to me, I think we're American filmmakers um, who happen to care about representation of Asians. And so we reflect the humor and love and fear that we grew up with. So that might be a little bit of a blend of, uh, of what we've been exposed to from Asia, but also a lot of influences from American and, yeah. and European side. I think that's the interesting thing about being Asian Americans is how um, we kind of have a different priority here. I mean, the, it, you know, Scarlet doesn't matter in Taiwan, maybe, but here, it, 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 you know, it's it's a big deal because uh, it's kind of like saying we're invisible in in a, in a sense, and in in and obviously we're we are not. We're part of everyday normal society and. And so it's it's kind of interesting to see how our uh, we we prioritize um, mm -hmm. the the diversity and yet in Asia it's a whole other thing, right? So um, no no on on the visi visibility front it, and the way we are in real life it's circling a little bit back to to Michael because uh, I was in that episode of American Horror Story, I was actually more scared of the racist hillbillies than of the um, supernatural. <laughs> but maybe there's something that hits it's close real. to home. Because it's real. <laughs> yeah. Why would you be afraid of racist hillbillies? Because <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Virginia. Um, Je Jennifer, you touched on something interesting about Ringu, um, is, which is that it's, uh, you know, I feel Hitchcock has, maybe it's Hitchcock who said it, but, um, Someone said there's nothing more s cinematic than seeing a woman in peril. Yeah. And it speaks to the fact that <laughs> cinema is, and, and I think horror definitely is seen through the male gaze. Oh, and yeah. then with Ringu, it's, I, I don't know, there's something terrifying about seeing a woman as the, um, as the villain instead of like... Spoiler alert. A, 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 <laughs> You know, a woman in peril running for her life. I don't know. Yes, that's true. Didn't think about it that way. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, in The Exorcist, you kind of have that too. You have a you have a rape metaphor in The Exorcist with right. a male kind of entering a woman, taking her over, and then making her evil, and then having her kill a bunch of people. Um, so, yeah. I mean, gosh, I could just go on too long, but. Uh, I will say, like, you just made me think of Get Out. When, the moment you said... God, I love that movie. Yeah, that's a fantastic movie. And when Everyone when I, needs to see that movie, in addition to theirs. Yeah, it's a highly required... Um, hmm. Yeah, it, in, in there you have a male in jeopardy, a black male in jeopardy, and, and, and for some reason that... And then the woman is... is I'm not going to say anything. Back that up. Uh, no, no, some, no, no. So, male in jeopardy. Um, and that was somehow refreshing to me. I don't know why. Um, but because were, black men, men are usually the villains, yeah, <laughs> or the maybe. first to die. First to die, yeah. And, and in this case, there was other stuff that happened that I can't spoil. But, <laughs> um, but yes, ultimately, if you look at the 80s, the 90s, the odd oddies, um, and, and, the, and the female in jeopardy genre, it's, it's, it's pretty, you know, you, it's a sell, it's a sell, okay? It's a way to get that I'm gonna get on my freaking podium. It's a way to get your cake and eat it too. You get a supposedly empowered person who's a female, but you also get to see her in every position possible. And you get to, see, and if you're a misogynist, you get to see her hurt. And if you're, um, and if you're, if you're a feminist, you feel like you're, you're you're seeing a woman's film. So it's a nice. I'm just gonna call it out right now. That that genre, Women in Jeopardy. As much as I probably will involve myself in those, that there's a little bit of having your cake and eat it too. So why it's always, it's always great when you have a woman who actually is developed, has, has an agenda, right. has a backstory, has a point of view, you know, then at least she's a person, you know, and not a victim who's stabbed. Yes. 
Although I, I will say the, the genre has had a long history of, of the, the women at the, at the resolution coming out on top and defeating the evil or the monster or whatever, I mean, you know, Alien and, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, whatever it is, you know, but the, there's been a long history and I think that's part of the gratification uh, in some of these movies for the audience is, is to see her go through hell and ultimately defeat, you know, her opponent, opponent and come to the top, so. Yeah. Right. Um, Viet, I'm gonna actually start the next third of discussion with you. Um, what, let's talk about the future of horror and where it's headed. Uh, specifically, like on your show, iZombie, which you've directed three episodes this past year, iZombie is a horror movie that's a horror show that's also a comedy show, and it's also a procedural, which is, I had never seen anything like it. Um, but then there's also something familiar with it, which feels a little bit Joss Whedon and a little bit Edgar Wright, which I, and I think you're like the Asian American Edgar Wright as a fanboy. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this, the future of the genre. Uh, I, I, I think, I think uh, with anything, you gotta, you, you gotta have an angle. You gotta get, have your angle on something. And, uh, and uh, I Zombie is a uh, uh, cop procedural with zombies. Uh, and I, I, you know, and and by the way, we still keep it grounded too. Uh, so, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, I think in, in the same vein with my my feature, Crush the Skull, I, um, which all of you guys can watch on Amazon Prime, by the way. Uh, no, uh, it's really I, fun, I, I think that you can. Uh, I, I I think our, my angle making that movie was that um, uh, you know we, we've seen plenty of horror movies, serial killer horror movies. And we've seen plenty of the comedic versions, and I guess my angle was trying to make it legitimately scary uh, and not make it just a big joke. And so it's, I, you know, I, you know, I can't say that I, I executed that perfectly, but that was, a, you know, I think with any genre and with any any filmmaker, I think what you want to try to do is just what's your new angle on something? What's the right. what's the what can you do? How can you shake things up? And and so, uh, I, I, and then, you know, I think Get Out is a great example of that too. It's just like, how do you shake, out the, shake up the genre? And, and I think race, specifically, as you can see in Get Out, uh, there's, there's plenty of ways to, to kind of open up a, a lot of different kinds of stories with, uh, in that genre, specifically. Cool. Let's go to uh, Michael next with that same question. What's the, what do you see as the future of the genre? Well, it, you know, it's basically everybody in this room. I mean, the, the genre is never going to go away. Uh, it's constantly reinvented itself. And, and uh, I mean, uh, you know, one of my favorite movies from the last few years is uh, this movie, Good Night, Mommy. Uh, I think it was from the Netherlands. I mean, it's, it's such a disturbing movie. And, and it's more cringeworthy than a lot of the other kind of straight horror films I've seen. But, you know, it's, it's, it's always going to be kind of like a, a platform for people who really have something creative to say. And um, I think, you know, you just kind of need to dig into the back of your brains and, and find what the next uh, thing is, what, what the, the disturbing element is. How do you approach, you know, extremes of emotion in a new and innovative way? And, and people will pick up on it. I mean, uh, they certainly, uh, James Wan certainly did so with when he did paranormal activity, you know, found, found a new way. So, so it's, um, it's out there. And, and like I said, I mean, it's, it's, I really think it's, it's the young people, the young filmmakers who are gonna find it. Jennifer. Yes. The question is, uh, where is the genre going? What's uh, the future for Jesus. us? Um, I hope to be part of that future. Uh, I, I think that, I think that it's, it's just, I, uh, I think Get Out set, set a new standard for the relevance of, of the genre and, and how it can be used for things we care about. Um, and, and, and I think that its success is, is, is a very exciting thing. Um, and I think it'll encourage more uh, genre filmmakers to to make their horror films not just about you know chopping up people into little pieces, but also you know the future of of their children. In addition to race, I'd also like to add female forward uh, female forward horror movies. Um, I I don't know who's seen Raw. 
in this audience, but it was like people fainted at the premiere, and it's great because it's about a woman who becomes a cannibal, but it's an allegory for a woman owning her own body, uh, coming in coming into her own sexuality, and because it's directed from a woman's point of view, you get to see things you would never see, like uh, you know, a woman waxing herself for a date. You see armpit hair, like all these very bodily things um, that humanize a woman that you don't really see in the genre normally. Um, we're arriving at the part of the discussion where we're gonna talk I about- I just wanted your... to clarify oh, one yeah. thing. I think James Wan made Saw. I, yeah. I just wanted to clarify that and not uh, okay. associate him with maybe a film series that he doesn't like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so, uh, so we're getting to the part of the discussion where we're going to talk about our careers and how we got to where we are, but following this uh, closing section, we're going to go out to the audience for Q&A, so please start thinking of questions for our panelists. Uh, we're going to start with you. Uh, what, how did you launch your career and how did you get to where you are today? Uh, I, um, I, I, uh, uh, <laughs> very good. I, <laughs> The end. <laughs> uh, it's tough. I, I, you know, I've, I, I was, I've been working in TV for a long time uh, uh, as an editor for about nine years now. Uh, and uh, I simultaneously, during all that time, I shot a shit ton of short films. And uh, one of them landed and got a little bit of uh, success. And then I, I was able to make a feature film based off of the success of that short film. So uh, let's, let's go into that in a little bit of detail. What okay. was like? So I, I made yeah. I made a short film called Crush the Skull, uh, which you can watch on YouTube, and um, that ended up winning uh, a short uh, the NBC Shortcuts Film Festival, which allowed me to. Uh, there was a, a few things that it gave me. I, I was able, I wrote a pilot for NBC, which nothing happened from that. But I also got a Panavision package, which allowed me to make. Uh, and then I and then I raised money to make a feature, and then the Panavision package saved me like like a hundred thousand dollars in equipment and stuff, so that I can make this feature for a super low budget. Then did I made you the kickstart it, and then I did a Kickstarter, and then I and then a production company helped pay for a little bit of the rest, and then I was able to make that that feature. Um, it ended up winning the LA Film Festival Best Horror a couple years ago, and during all that time, I was I was an editor, and um, the show that I was working on as an editor. Um, those producers had seen my short film and was impressed with it. So uh, when they were given a, an opportunity to, they were able to bump me up to, to let me direct uh, iZombie, the second season. So there's a kind of a couple things going on. I was, I was doing things on the side, but I was also working in TV. And um, so I was able to kind of, um, uh, off, of, off of basically a short film, impress some producers, but also um, that short film allowed me to make a feature as well. So then I, I had a feature film, and then I directed my first uh, episode of TV in that same year. Uh, and then um, now, after now, that, I directed a couple more. So now you you were in a couple of the studio director programs. Would you say that those programs were responsible for you directly getting that first job? No, not at all. Actually, I, I was able to get into programs as a result of getting to direct TV. So I, I kind of went backwards a little yeah. bit. Um, but but now that I've been in the program, it it has been helping me in the sense of trying to get out there as a as a young director and and land more, get you know just expose myself to other executives and stuff like that and um, try to land the, the next gig. So I'm I'm kind of in that transitional period where I'm not editing anymore and I will be just directing full time and and landing, you know, just trying to land more uh, television directing gigs. So great. Jennifer, how did you get to where you are today? Okay, uh, in high school. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, I just fell in love with the process of running around with the camera. And um, I, my mom let me um, major in media studies in college. I mean, she didn't even stop, she didn't stop me. Um, and that meant more cameras. And I got encouragement, it made me feel empowered. And I eventually, I did. I, I got involved in documentary uh, producing and editing, but then applied to AFI. Got into AFI through referrals from my media studies experience, 
if I meant I'm committing to this crazy industry, I committed. The directing uh, program. At yeah, AFI. the AFI directing program. And the program itself is speci uh, specifically geared toward collaboration. So you stay in your zone. If you're a director, you're a director. You're not a DP. You're, you're, not, you're not cutting, even though I you know, uh, you know, wanted to like, mess with that stuff. But um, it, was, it was a beautiful thing. And I got it, I, I, then I slipped into all these random diversity programs, like Project Involved, which was instrumental in getting me on the set of um, you know, bigger films and with Forrest Whitaker in them, and yeah. Um, and then from there, I was invited to the, the project, the Film Independent Lab, and that's when I made my first feature through scenes that I shot with a grant from Panavision. Um, and that, that trailer like, helped me raise like $500,000 for my first feature. That got into Sundance three years later. And then um, from there, you know, the Sundance Labs invited me. From there, I started trying to do a bunch of false starts on my second feature. Um, there was a crisis, the financial crisis of 2008, right. and it was terrible. And so things weren't easy. And then when ITVS asked me to, to submit a proposal, that kind of rebooted me because I, I could start fresh. And, and the, the, the little short film that I invented in my... Washington Heights, New York apartment that in about a week, you know, became this much bigger thing. How, just, how, how do you do a future stage short? Do they, they approach, they find you or? They found me because of Half-Life. It was the second, third season. They'd already got, you know, worked with Marine, Marine, Marine Barani and Barry Jenkins. And then I was the third season. Um, and, 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 you know, I think because they'd seen me work with visual effects before um, and having future concerns, you know, they wanted, they wanted, a diverse group of directors as well. So that was all great. And the response to the short was fantastic. So I was able to leverage that into a Kickstarter and also um, bringing on Ken Jong and Jennifer Ely um, for the feature. And uh, all, uh, a lot of leveraging, <laughs> a lot of, <laughs> a lot of uh, trying, to, trying to make one small thing make a, make a bigger thing and then make a bigger thing. So very entrepreneurial. Now, other than like, making a brilliant film, which is the hardest part, what would you say, uh, would, what kind of advice would you give to filmmakers trying to get into Sundance? Sundance? Ooh. Uh, as, with a short or a feature? Either. With a short? Oh, boy. Um, Just make a brilliant movie. That's, that's it. I mean, <laughs> that's all. What else would you do? Because the odds are like really one in a hundred of getting in, like literally. Play it by numbers. Get into. I got into other festivals first. Um, Outfest. You know, I had issues-oriented films. Sundance gives a shit about the films that mean something that will help us evolve our world to and make it a better place. Um, so know that. Um, I don't think they care. They do care about. White boy problems, they do. Um, but they, <laughs> half of, at least half of the films are about white boy problems, but another half of the films aren't. And so keeping that in mind, you know, what do I actually care about? You know, I think those will help, help, stand, help you stand out. Um, and the same goes for features. But it is very much like kind of working everything forever, you know. It, 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 for me, it was like always, a, it's all hard, hard for me to like hustle, like, you know, Network, go to every party. I'm not that person, right. so I had to balance that. But you also have to spend a great deal of time doing your work and reading books and going to museums and um, thinking about things, watching other people's films. So um, it's, a, it's about balancing all of that in a healthy way and quitting right. your day job. And uh, <laughs> you're also you're also a graduate of a studio program recently. Do you think that was helpful for you getting your uh, exorcist gig? Right, so I did the Warner Brothers program, and I also did the. Um, so I actually got uh, my. I had a. I did a, an episode of Major Crimes, but I. I. I it was that was kind of get gonna get it. I was gonna get the episode, I think, but they just wanted to. I asked if I could also do the program, the Warner Brothers oh. program, first because you know just so I could get my feet wet. So that was the first effort, and then somehow the, through a connection through Sundance, I met Gina Reyes who also introduced me to the, the Fox program. Fox program was extremely instrumental. Um, someone dropped out on The Exorcist and I was there and they loved my film, so they, they hired me. That's perfect. So, so what I'm hearing about the Warner Brothers program, and I have some inside knowledge on this, for those of you who are interested in that, you basically have to have an episode lined up already before you get in, would you guys say? Would I don't know if you have to, but I, I think that it definitely helps. Right. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Michael, let's uh, talk about your uh, your career path. It's an interesting one. Well, that that kind of suggests that uh, you, you've achieved something, and I. I it's I a mean, very decorated one. I like to. I I always like to feel like I haven't achieve success yet because I, I think once once you feel like you've achieved what you set out to do then you have to find another goal because you've already reached it so so it's always just sort of trying to get there for me but you know I mean I've been a cinematographer for 38 years and uh, you know I've shot a, a lot of stuff uh, before I started directing uh, features and episodics and and so I guess I already came with a, a lot of uh, Experience, but you know, it's, it's somebody said to me one time, you know, you've shot 50 feature films that I've never even heard of, and it's, it's totally exactly true. I mean, I shot a lot of movies that never got distribution, that you know, mm. got very spotty distribution, but they were my training ground to to get to where I've gotten. And I, and I have to be perfectly honest, you know, it, it's the the whatever I've achieved success wise in recent years is really entirely due to my wife. Uh, we we celebrated our tenth anniversary actually last night. Um, and oh, by the way, my success is my wife too. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's you know I, I was working in this business for for a long time for what twenty five years before I met my wife Gina and. It wasn't until uh, I dated actresses for 20 years, which is, you know, not, not conducive to uh, the things that give you peace. But, but um, you know, when I met Gina, she gave me such enormous uh, freedom, both uh, personal and professional freedom, because I was always driven by the things that I thought I should be doing. I, I should do this because this, this pays well and stuff. But I was doing a lot of stuff that I was just not connected to that I had no emotional investment in. And it was Gina who said, uh, you know, just stop and, and do something that, that actually means something to you. And that's, that's what kind of redirected my thinking. And, and in, in short time, it's what led me to, to work on shooting Glee, which then led to American Horror Story. And, and you know, and I have to be, you know, I have to laugh sometimes when people come up to me and says, I've, I've loved everything you've ever done. I said, you know, come on, you've never seen anything I've done before in Glee or American Horror Story. Really, seriously. But, you know, all of this is really entirely due to Gina giving me that, that mental freedom to not feel like I have to do this, you know, that I should pursue the things that, that I want to do. I love that. It's very zen. Um, okay, what, I'm seeing that time's up. I'm just going to ask... One quick question before we go to Q and A. What what's next for you guys, Michael? Um, I just finished directing uh, an episode of Nashville, and I got an Asian actress on woo, it as a, <laughs> in a prominent role as a bartender. They said, hey, "Are there Asian bartenders in Nashville?" I said, "There are in my episode." Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm in, I'm prepped to direct as I, I said the, this ten million million dollar movie, Mary. And I wrote a script uh, called Guthrie uh, about the theft of Barbie dolls, which has gone to casting. So those are the immediate things that are going on. Um, uh, there's some behind this. There's some things I might be directing soon, but but on the creation side, I have three projects in parallel. One is um, related to to a climate scientist. Um, one is a sci-fi love story, and uh, the third one is a little bit like a dystopian future pilot. Great. Cool. Um, I have nothing going on. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, Lies. Lies. <laughs> I, uh, the only thing I have, I have something cooking right now. Uh, I can't talk too much about it, but it's uh, based off an 80s, of a, the 80s video game. So, but we'll, we'll see what happens. I love 80s video games. Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> um, all right, let's go to Q&A. Who's got one? This guy. Is there, uh, is there someone with a mic? Great. Well, first of, first of all, thank you. I mean, I, I had no idea, and, and you all have been doing this for a long, long time to get where you are. I, I remember when uh, Quentin Lee and Justin Lin's uh, film Shopping for Fangs came out, it was 20 years ago and a great uh, film. God. Yeah. but my, my question is uh, we talked about get out but it seems like just in the last couple of years there's been more films where these asian characters this 
pop out in, in horror films. One was The Watcher, which is an interracial couple, but Chop Shimono actually plays the protagonist. And I just saw another film called Eyes of My Mother, where it happens in the Midwest or somewhere, and suddenly you have this you know, a Asian uh, American lesbian character that just jumps up and you know, has a supporting role. Do you see, well, what strategy do you see to be able to interject Asian American actors and characters, I know you're doing that now, into the horror genre? Well, the easy strategy, which is not that easy, is creating them from scratch and being that, that original showrunner, which I think so some people are So you write the trying, role. You write the role in, yeah. And, and maybe the strategy is to kind of ground it in their background, um, like perhaps their character flaw, their, char their character strength comes from something Asian, <laughs> a war, or you know, immigration perhaps. Um, that's one strategy. I think, yeah, just again, what I said earlier, I think just normalizing, uh, you know, what's normal. I mean, just putting out there what we see every day in our lives anyway. Um, I, you know, like I, I had this, this project that I've been wanting to get off the ground and, and I pitch it as, I want to see this TV show that represents all the Asians I know, dumb Asians. And, uh, and I had this project where it's just a bunch of dumb, stupid Asians doing some stupid shit. And, um, and it's like, like Seinfeld or Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And, I love that idea. And I just, and I just feel like that's, it's normal. It's just that it's not out there. And I, think, I feel like, you know, that's, that's, you know, there's only so much we can do at this point. So for, for us as creators that, you know, we're just doing what we know and, um, Hopefully, you know, uh, I'm sure my movie didn't, my movie Crush the Skull has Asian Americans in it, acting like just normal people. But, you know, I feel like if it was a bigger movie, if it had a lot of big, a lot of success, uh, then that just helps normalize everything. And then in the next time around, it's not that big of a deal to cast an Asian American as a, as a lead, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's baby steps towards that. And also just having a cast that's just Multicultural to begin with, and then and, and, and just treating everyone as equals in that in that sense, like a narrative equal. Um, I remember when they cast Steve Yoon in um, exactly. Walking Dead, yeah. and every you that's know, huge for me. Everyone loved everyone loves that. Beautiful, and he's like this favorite character. Apparently, they when he went away, it was a bad thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when I stopped watching. Yeah, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I I had I had like this little argument with with a childhood friend. I'm, I'm from Texas, and I have like a hillbilly. I have scary hillbilly friends. But uh, you know, I have, a, I have a friend who talked about uh, Tim Burton's quote a, a year ago, talking about, um, he said that he doesn't, he only uses some minority characters if, it, if the story calls for it. And, and you know, childhood friend is just like, yeah, see, that makes sense. And I'm like, well, but what are you talking about? What, what is calling for it? What is yeah. calling for it mean? And, and this is a friend of mine who I grew up with, our school was, you know, very diverse. We were like, you know, 70% black school. And diversity was very normal for us. And, and um, for Tim Burton to say, calling for it, I mean, I don't, I don't understand what calling for it means. I mean, uh, which I, that means that we would be the scientists in the, in the movie if it called for it or, you know. It a, assumes that whites are the default. And that's yeah, not yeah. the case in society. And I, and I, you know, I just feel like it's, you know, where we've all grown up, I mean, I, I think as, I'm pretty sure everybody in here has seen an Asian before, uh, be a, just a, a, you know, someone that's not a scientist or an accountant. I'm pretty sure, I don't know, but, uh, and you know, I, I, think that's, I think that's what we're just trying to do, is just like baby steps towards that. Another question. You. You. <laughs> In the glasses. You, the Asian one. The Asian yeah. one, yeah. Hello, I'm the Asian one. <laughs> um, I really admire your work. Thank you for all your time. But I noticed as all of you were talking about your careers and reminiscing about it, you were all trained or worked in a different discipline, like Viet was an editor, Jen was in docs, and Michael is a DP. Um, would you recommend aspiring and up-and-coming filmmakers to train themselves in a separate discipline other than straight-up directing so they can understand a wider scope of the filmmaking process? Oh yeah, for sure. I, you know, I, I when I started out, I, I was in a very, very good position where 
Uh, I knew I knew a showrunner, and he calls me up, and he's like, "Hey, I got a show on the air. What do you want to do?" And I was like, "Out of film school," and I was like, "I want to direct." And he's like, "No, I'm not doing it. You know, you're not going to you're not going to direct right out of film school. That's that's not how it works." And so I became a PA. I was I started out, and you know, I and I just thought about what is a skill that I felt like I would I would be good at. And at that time, I you know I was I was pretty good at editing and, and the whole process of being an indie filmmaker. So I started out as a post production uh, PA. Worked up, became an assistant editor at some point, and then became an editor after that. And um, but what that allowed me to do was uh, just work in the industry, no matter what, whether I liked it or not. I had to go to work and uh, clock in and clock out. And um, but you you're just you're surrounded you're surround and then you're surrounded by everybody who's who are making a good living, you know with this, these skills and, and so for you know years and years and years I've just been stealing all these directors dance moves and uh, you know using them for my for when, when I got my opportunity and I, and I just feel like uh, and then on top of all that I mean you're meeting so many people I mean through all those years uh, working you know I know Michael can say the same thing I mean we've, we've worked with so many great showrunners and producers and creators and stuff so by the time you get to that point um, you have a lot of people who already know who, who you are and everything. So, uh, you know, I, I just feel like in this industry, I mean, everybody wants to be a director or, you know, or something to that effect. And, but, you know, but there's a million other jobs that you can do that, that will help you, you know, get as a stepping stone to get there. And I, I would say also, I mean, it, it, you know, in the words of the philosopher Yoda, <laughs> you know, do or do not. There is no try. And I, I think a lot of people who have maybe unique visions that would benefit this industry just don't pursue it. They, they talk endlessly about this great idea for a screenplay and they just don't sit down and write it. They talk endlessly about this movie that they want to make and then they just don't do it. You know, they talk themselves out of it. I mean, it, in this generation, at this point in time, you don't have any excuse for not making a movie. I mean, you can make a movie on your freaking iPhone and edit it in on your computer. You know, if, if you have what it takes to be a filmmaker, make a freaking movie. Just make it. You know, like, like Eli Wallach said, I'm, I'm a storehouse of a movie memory. You know, in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, when the guy came in there and Eli's in the bathtub and the guy's going to shoot him, he says, ah, I finally found you. Every time I tried to shoot with my other arm, I remember the time you shot my arm and stuff. And then Eli Wallach has a gun in the bubble bath and he shoots him dead. And he says, if you have to shoot, shoot. Don't talk. You know, just do it. <laughs> or crush the skull. Uh, we had a question right here, too. Uh, yeah, with, uh, with the uh, growing international market, in, the Asian market in particular, do you guys feel that you've been able to capitalize that or take advantage of that when you're trying, in your efforts to cast more Asian Americans? Or do you feel that's an entirely separate world? When, when Netflix acquired Advantageous, their goal was to have some Asian faces. <laughs> I mean, a great film, but also, you know, no, they were about to launch internationally. They were about to open up all those markets, the Asian markets. So, like, Jen, you know, Jennifer, your film is going to be, you know, um, there so that when we hit Australia, when we hit Asia, you know, we have some content. So it's very, it's very exciting. It's very exciting. They said, and I think, I think um, that was a big idea. So it's been cool because. It, you know, we've been getting letters from all over the world as a result. Um, but yeah, I think at least some companies think that way. Yeah. Ryan. About uh, how do you cross over from one department to the other? For example, Michael, when you were uh, a DP on Ryan Murphy shows, how did you cross over from being that DP to being a director of his shows? Like, was it a matter of expressing what you want, or was it a matter of Ryan saying, hey, I like your skills, what do you want to do? And same with you two, like, how did you cross over from being an editor on iZombie and becoming a director of it, and, and how you transitioned from, from what you were to where you got to? Well, for me, it, it, it was kind of all Jessica Lang. Um, she did not like uh, two of the directors in season three of American Horror Story, and she went to Fox, I believe, and Ryan 
and said, why isn't Michael directing this show? He knows wow. the show better than anybody. He knows us better than anybody. He should be directing. And that's how I got an episode in season four, and it, it turns out to be the uh, pivotal episode that introduced Neil Patrick Harris, and, and um, he has sex with Sarah Paulson, who had two heads, and, and you know, there was a lot of stuff <laughs> in it. And Ryan really liked the episode, and then he was like, okay, so you're a director, and then I got two more episodes the following season and stuff. So that's, that's how it, it kind of went, you know, is, is through my relationship with, with those actors and the trust that they already had in me. You had an advocate for you. That's important. I would go. Oh, are you talking? Sorry. I'll go right after you. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say, um, you know, I, uh, you know, as I said earlier, I, as an editor, I, I built relationships with uh, showrunners and all that stuff. But I, I have to say, I, I do have to emphasize one thing, which is what Michael said. And I, I talked in a panel. I, I talked at a different panel last year, and I, I said, I, I told the the group, I said. Um, before I directed an episode of TV, I, and at the time I, I was kind of guesstimating. I was like, I think I've directed about 80 short films. And, um, and then I was just like, did I, did I overshoot that? And I called my brother afterwards and I was like, I, I just told a whole panel that I'd done 80 short films. And my brother's like, no, that's about right. And, um, and that's about, you know, maybe over the last 20 years I've shot four short films. And I'm like, okay, yeah, the math is actually right. And, and here, here's the thing. Did, did I finish all those short films? No. Um, or will I let you see any of them? I'll let you see maybe five of them. But I think, I think the point is, though, is that you, you know, uh, maybe I could have gotten a, a gig just uh, my bump directing uh, as an editor uh, anyway. But, um, I, but once I got that bump, um, would I have been ready? I don't know, but uh, over you know, 20 years of making shitty short films and working with really bad actors and really good actors or whatever, that made me confident enough to make, be able to, to do this. And um, so you know, I, I feel like you know, it's exactly what Michael said. If, if, you wanna, if you wanna do something, just do it. And, you, and um, you know, sh I, my, my advice, you know, when I made Crush of Skull, which won me an award, it got that showrunner impressed with my work and said, you know what, I think he can direct. Um, I shot that short film for exactly what, what, what Michael was saying. I shot that with a, I didn't shoot it with an iPhone, but I shot it with a DSLR. For, with zero money, I shot it with three people in one location. Uh, all three of those people were my friends. Uh, I held the mic like this myself while we were shooting it. And, and it won a, a film festival. I, you know, I got a Panavision package that saved me $100,000 from that, and I wrote a, a pilot for NBC. So, and, and, but I, I will say, when I made that short film, I had no idea. I, it, was, it was just another stupid short film that I thought was just gonna, you know, just disappear like all the other shitty ones that I had done. So you just, but you know, I felt like it's kind of like working out. It's like, you're doing it, it's like a pickup game, a ball, you know? You're just going and you're practicing, and you're just, you're just developing more and more skills and then one day it landed, and uh, and it kind of basically was the reason why I'm, I you know I'm in the DGA or why I work in television as a director now and all that stuff. So, anyway, work your ass off, and yes, use your your relationships in the meantime. And the only thing I have to add to that is you know play to your strengths first, and then evolve from there. There's a, a great example of um, the director of The Witch who was a fantastic production designer. And, and that's his strength, you know, knowing how to, you know, put something on screen that's extraordinary, that's from like the 16th century, that pops. Um, and, and so he played to this, his strengths and, and teamed up with a great DP and, and producer. And, um, and that's leading to bigger and better things and winning awards at Sundance and stuff. So there are many ways to transition. You're going to have to find your own path. Um, and, and don't ignore the, the things that you're really great at or that you feel really passionate about, if it's producing, if it's shooting or, or design. Any other questions? Yes, you. You. Thank you. Um, so I'm always hearing the argument for, you know, attending, for or against attending more uh, art and film school. And so specifically for Jennifer, do you, do you feel like you could have done the films you wanted to do or got into the programs after without attending the AFI directing program? 
Okay, I didn't totally hear that. I'm sorry. Uh, you're asking if if I, I would have gotten into my the programs I got into if I hadn't attended AFI. Yes. I helped a lot because it, it, it for me because it established a certain amount of legitimacy. All right. There's a brand. There's a brand associated with you that's understood. If you don't have that, there are a thousand other ways to do it, um, but it involves maybe working through different organizations, volunteering, and, and taking, I mean, every route can be a really long route um, to whatever your dream is. Um, but yeah, it helped me. Um, On the flip side, I, I went to uh, University of Texas Film School, and um, no one has ever asked me what film school I went to, yeah. <laughs> ever. Um, that was our last question. We are out of time. I would like, uh, before we congratulate these guys, uh, as this panel is sponsored by the Directors Guild of America, I'd like to ask the co-chairs, Kevin Berlandi and Ron Dempsey, to raise your hands. If you have questions about joining the Guild, please direct your questions to them. Lastly, I'd like to thank our wonderful panelists. I'd like to thank Viet Wen, who is very witty and acerbic, and Jennifer Pong, who is prescient and woke, and <laughs> Michael Goy, who is so intelligent and generous. Thank and you all. And we want to thank Stephen, who, is, who did a great job. He's a uh, part of the GGA, too, and a very talented filmmaker. And, and uh, thanks, thanks for asking uh, them the questions. Thanks. OK. <laughs> We'll be around a bit if you want to talk to us. <laughs>